Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar, Numbers and the Stories Behind Them, Integrating Quantitative and Qualitative Approaches to Evaluation. My name is Zach Stewart, and I will be uh, running the tech side of today's event. I just have a few housekeeping slides to go over before we get started. This event is being recorded, and audio is now broadcasting, so you should be hearing the audio broadcast. Audio is provided via your computer speakers as well as your phone today. Um, if you would like to speak at all during today's presentation, and at the end we will have time for people to share uh, personal stories, um, you will need to join via phone. And uh, just let us know in that all questions box under the slide uh, if you need any help joining via phone. Uh, a recording for today's event will be available after the event. This training is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The contents of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA, the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the, Cent the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, or DHHS. The training should not be considered a substitute for individualized client care and treatment decisions. We are providing captioning for this webinar. Click the link on your screen to access live captions. Uh, we also have provided this link uh, in the All Questions box, which will be available throughout the event. Captions will open in a new window or tab that you can position anywhere you like on your screen, and you can adjust the size, color, and speed of the captions. Your line will be muted for the duration of today's presentation, uh, but I will be able to unmute your line um, at the end you know, when we have the portion to speak over the line. So if you look towards the top of the PowerPoint slides there, there's an icon of a person raising their hand. Uh, and so if you click that, I will know to unmute your line. Um, or you can let us know in the public chat, and I can also help you there. If you have any questions for our presenters, uh, please use the questions box, and we'll address them throughout today's presentation, as well as at the end. If you need any technical support at any time, uh, type in the box, and we'll, we're happy to help you uh, right in that box. Again, that's the all questions box right underneath the slides there. Uh, we also have a slide deck, a PDF of the slide deck, uh, available for download, and that is right to the left of the all questions box right underneath the slide. Again, this is uh, an icon to show you how to raise your hand. It looks like that little guy raising his hand. You also have a couple options. Uh, if you click the downward facing arrow right next to him uh, to show us a couple different statuses as well if you would like. And with that, I will pass things over to today's moderator, Fran Beige. Uh, Fran, can you verify you are off mute and ready to go? One sec, Fran. It looks like you're on mute. Oh, there I am. There <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, today's webinar. We're really glad to have you. And I'm particularly excited about this topic um, a way long time ago. Uh, my master's thesis was a program evaluation of seven uh, statewide family centers across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where I am. And I used both qualitative and quantitative methods. And I really think it added to the value and the change um, that was needed for these programs. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer. Um, I want to introduce you to today's two presenters. Um, the first is my colleague here at Advocates for Human, Amanda Akanian. And um, she has been doing research and evaluation work in our, in our research and evaluation center for more than 10 years. Um, she's designed and implemented quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method studies. And she's currently the, uh, directing the evaluation of a supportive housing program for people with behavioral health disorders in Boston, as well as a number of other um, ongoing evaluation studies. And um, our second uh, presenter, Dixie King, um, who is the founder of Transforming Local Communities. 
um, has 25 years of research and evaluation experience. She's done primary prevention and intervention programs, substance abuse treatment, integrated services, um, and has uh, done uh, her evaluation work throughout California um, and through the miracle of virtual um, uh, technology is now able to um, talk with all of you today. So I'm going to hand it over to Dixie. Thank you so much, Fran. And uh, Fran and I were talking earlier about our, our mutual ties with Star Trek, so we are definitely dating ourselves, Fran. So <laughs> welcome, everyone. And uh, Amanda and I are going to kind of be tag teaming here. Um, I'm going to um, be asking her to uh, to give her perspectives on a variety of things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, this presentation is really about the interplay between quantitative and qualitative methods and program evaluation, and I was telling the team earlier today um, about my own history here, which I was involved in program evaluation um, from the time. I'm actually a cultural anthropologist, um, and so you don't find a ton of us in program evaluation, but we're becoming more popular. Um, but I was actually invited as a graduate student while I was working on my doctoral dissertation to participate in some national evaluations um, as part of a team from an evaluation company that was run by a professor on campus. And um, he brought me in specifically because they did black box evaluation, as he called it, numbers in, numbers out. And it was becoming really clear to him that they needed qualitative expertise, and they didn't have it. The beauty is, is that he was very aware that qualitative expertise is, is, in fact, its own subject and content area, and that it's not just a case of anybody can do it because it doesn't really require training. Um, I'm sure, and I would, I would just love to know how many of you have run into people in your careers who um, they say, oh, a survey is easy. I can put a survey together. I put surveys together all the time. And then they get the survey results back, and they discover just how ambiguous their questions were, and they discover how problematic the analysis is, and all of the problems that they run into. Um, that is exactly the same case for qualitative methods. Um, it does take training and it does take expertise. And that doesn't mean we don't all have some basic skills, because we do. But we really need to bring them in a very specific context into evaluation. So I'm going to ask right now, to, we have a little poll here. How many of you have formal training in qualitative methods? Um, and so we're talking about either in the classroom or um, field site training but where you've actually been mentored or received some assistance in learning qualitative methods. Great, okay, and I will tell those of you who are quantitative specialists that I got a C in my first college level statistics class because the theoretical side of those numbers made no sense to me until we started applying them. And once we got into applied statistics, all of a sudden it made sense to me. So um, I don't know how many of you have had a similar experience with qualitative methods, but um, they, can work for you, they can work against you, but, um, but they can also um, really challenge you. And so I think today, um, a couple of things. We're going to start with some pretty simple definitions only because as evaluators, we have lots and lots and lots of different ways of interpreting um, formative, summative, qualitative, quantitative. And so I just want some basic definitions so we're all on the same page. Um, I also just really um, want participation from all of you, if we can have it. Um, Fran's going to be uh, watching the chat box um, since I'm talking, and Amanda's going to be busy um, contributing here. But she'll be watching the chat box. But as um, Zach said, we're going to have opportunities for you to actually have some voice participation later. We'd love to hear your stories from the field. And for those of you who don't have training in qualitative methods. Um, I hope this is helpful for you today and that you'll start to see the value. We're always making decisions um, when we're starting an evaluation regarding the cost effectiveness of what we can do, the feasibility of what we can do, and all of those questions are going to play a big role in whether or not we choose to use qualitative methods or we stick to quantitative methods. So we'll also talk about that and where the cost benefit is um, in relative terms um, to bringing qualitative into the mix. So let me um, start by just those of you who are on with us on April 30th will remember this definition. 
the simplest definition of evaluation. This is the elevator speech that it took me 15 years to figure out so that I could tell people when they asked me what I did. Evaluation is simply a way to measure whether and how people's lives have changed as a result of a program or service. And so in its simplest dynamic, that's really what we're doing is we're seeing whether or not a program has been effective. What does that mean? We're trying to see if people's lives have changed. So let's talk about evaluation versus research just for a moment. And there, there's a reason why. There's some implications here. Usually an evaluation is going to focus on a particular program in a particular school or neighborhood or community. And the purpose is obviously going to be to see whether or not that program is effective and or how it can be improved. We'll also talk about formative versus summative in a few moments. Now, research, obviously, is really looking for generalizable truths. And the purpose is to establish facts that will hold true across many schools, neighborhoods, and communities. Qualitative methods have a role in both. We tend to, I think, see more um, dynamic uses for uh, qualitative methods in, um, if you're not a, a cultural anthropologist at least, in um, evaluation than you will in research. But in fact, qualitative methodologies are a very dynamic research, um, research opportunity, um, if you will, um, in a lot of different contexts. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So as evaluators, as opposed to researchers, um, our role is really to provide project decision makers with the best possible information that we can come up with on which to base their decisions. And those decisions have major implications for how programs are run and for the sustainability of programs. Historically, this was done with numbers, obviously. And that's that black box uh, perspective, data in, data out. So quantitative methods, and this is out of BABI. Many of you will be very familiar with BABI, especially if you teach. Quantitative methods have traditionally been equated with objective measurements and the statistical, mathematical, or numerical analysis of data collected through polls, questionnaires, and surveys. Quantitative research focuses on gathering numerical data and generalizing it across group, a group of people or to explain a particular phenomenon. And <laughs> I like this. Um, my, uh, one of my favorite definitions of quantitative versus qualitative. We call data quantitative if, if it's in numeric form and qualitative if it's not. So as a qualitative methodologist by training and by, uh, by persuasion, um, this is, for me, an example of deficit reasoning. Qualitative is not defined by what it isn't. It's defined by what it is. So let's talk for a moment about what qualitative is. Qualitative researchers stress the socially constructed nature of reality. What does that mean? Well, let's talk for a moment about the fact that we know that researchers impact what we study. I mean, I think that's a given at this point. We don't operate out of Petri dishes. And so um, there are situational constraints that are going to shape our inquiry, as, as this quote talks about. But also, um, we are really looking at people's perceptions and how perception impacts behavior. And that becomes extraordinarily important because people don't operate on fact, do they? They operate on perception. And so qualitative methods can really bring to the forefront some of the issues that are going to get in the way of program implementation or that are going to enhance program implementation and can really provide some structural um, information that can be of great importance to program managers and to um, program staff. And Amanda, you know, jump in here at any point because, as you know, I can talk on forever. Do you want to add anything to what I've been talking about so far? I think you might be on mute. Amanda? Yep, there I'm here. Sorry. Zach, okay. Zach just unmuted me. Um, no, I think okay. you've, you've heard everything so far. I don't have anything to add at this point. Okay. Very good. I'm going to keep checking in with you and don't hesitate to interrupt. Okay. Um, so here's a question. Are you going formative or summative? Um, when you are sitting down to determine your methodology or your methodological approach to an evaluation, you have a lot of things to consider. And whether or not you're going to use qualitative methods may, in fact, be determined by other questions. So you know, is your evaluation going to be formative or is it summative? And for those of you who are not program evaluators or who don't necessarily know all of this language, 
formative evaluation is what we do when programs are pretty much still under development or they're in the process of being implemented and we can still make changes to program content or program structure or program delivery. And so the whole purpose of formative evaluation is to improve the program, to make sure that it's being implemented at the highest possible level of efficacy. And so our decisions then are going to focus on ways to improve specific components of the program. This is in contrast to summative evaluation, where you're really concerned with whether a program has shown sufficient efficacy to justify its continuation. So is it going to be sustained or is it going to be terminated? Now here's where I always stop because, let's face it, um, we can, and if you've been in the field for five years or longer, I know that you've run into this, and that is you can do a formative evaluation and you can provide very specific and important information about whether or not something is working. Um, I'm going to give Fidelity here as an example. We know that if, um, we, we believe that if people are faithful to a program's design and they're using it, an evidence-based model, and they're using it with um, a population um, that is similar to the one on which the programs, with which the program's been tested, that we're going to get similar results. And so, in essence, that kind of gives us um, not a free pass to not evaluate, but we are probably going to focus more of our evaluation on fidelity to the program model. In other words, our staff actually doing this program faithfully. Um, that's going to have a lot of implications for whether or not you see success at the other end. Um, however, you can faithfully implement a program. You can do a beautiful job of program implementation. You can show excellent outcomes because it's not just are you only going to do formative or are you only going to do summative. You may be doing both, right, over the course of three to five year grant. And here's the issue, and that's that small p politics and large p politics come into the mix. So you may actually show that a program has great efficacy and yet it doesn't continue to be funded or it doesn't continue to be sustained. And that might be because of local constraints, it might be because of resources or funding, or it might be because it, somebody else has a favorite program and they are in a, the position to be able to um, enforce that program um, or use that program or uh, prefer that program over the program that already has demonstrated efficacy. Um, I see this a lot in schools and we get as a result a lot of folks who are very um, jaded about new programs and services coming in because services and programs come and go with such frequency. So always we have that political motivation that we have to be aware of in the background. You can also demonstrate that programs are not having a very efficacious um, outcome and yet they continue to be funded or they continue to be sustained because they're somebody's favorite program. So that's the reality of the world we live in, but we do the best we can as researchers and as people who are trying to um, demonstrate um, the value of a program, we do our best to show the reality of it and how it can be improved over time. Now, we've talked formative and summative. I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about process versus outcome data. Process data um, in my book, these are my definitions, and I realize that some people will argue with some of these definitions, and we won't spend time arguing today, but that's a great, that's a great topic to be arguing, because it's hard to ensure that we come to agreement on all of our terms. But process data for me refers to the nose count data. That's, for example, how many numbers you served. I served 454 clients over the course of the last 12 months with an average dosage, meaning average number of hours of service, average number of groups um, participated in. Um, it, we're, when we talk dosage in, in this context, we're usually not talking about medical dosage, although we might be talking about um, compliance with medication. Um, so that's also a possibility. But we're going to talk about um, basically our count, okay, the numbers. Now, <laughs> that's in contrast to outcome data, but here's one of the issues. Clients often confuse process and outcome data. So I'll ask somebody about what their outcome showed, and they'll tell me, oh, they were fantastic. We served 454 people, and we said we'd serve 425, so we have been successful in our program. And to me, that is confusing process and outcome data because I'm not necessarily concerned with the numbers you served. That's one part of what I'm concerned with. But I am equally and even more so concerned with what outcomes you got. 
has the program been successful in attaining its objectives? Now, if your objective was to serve 425 people, you've been successful in that objective, but do you have objectives that also relate, again, to whether or not your program is serving the needs of your client population effectively? Are your clients' lives changing in a positive way as a result of the intervention that they're getting? Okay. So this is, again, very sophomoric. This is very simplistic, but for formative decisions, we might use things like pre and post psychological assessments. We might look at fidelity assessments. We might look at focus groups. We might be doing some interviews. Um, for summative decisions, we might be doing a very formal pre-test, post-test control group design. Um, so, and there are obviously many, many shades of gray um, in between. No illusion meant there. Um, so qualitative methods can be used in program evaluation in a variety of ways, and this is not an inclusive um, set of, of methods. We're going to talk about some of these in detail a little bit later, but it can be used to conduct needs assessment, to pilot test quantitative instruments, to discover why an intervention worked or didn't work, to explain the results that are gleaned from quantitative research, to learn ways of attracting program users, to better understand perceptions and attitudes around program planning, content, and delivery, which means that staff can be the focus, by the way, of our qualitative methods, not just clients, and to better understand data findings. So we have another poll for you now, and this poll is to ask, for those of you who have used qualitative methods in program evaluation, how have you used these? And so that, can we pull our poll up? And we'll ask people to let us know what are the ways in which you have personally used program evaluation? I mean, program evaluation. Yeah, how have you used that? How have you used qualitative methods in program evaluation? Okay. So lots of you have used it to conduct needs assessment. And by the way, you can have multiple answers here, not just one. So um, you can. a lot of you have used it to pilot test instruments. So two right now. Also, to better understand perceptions and attitudes around program planning, content, and delivery. It's another big one. Uh, about 40% of you, it looks like, 45% have used it to explain the results gleaned from quantitative research. I hope some of you have stories about that because, man, I've got some really interesting stories about that, and I know Amanda does too. And then, yeah, it looks like the biggest number of you have used, um, used it to conduct needs assessment. So absolutely, that's a great use. Thank you for not equating needs assessment with survey because in my neck of the woods, that's still nine times out of 10 what a program manager will equate quality, I'm, I'm sorry, needs assessment with is a survey. And surveys are useful, but man, they also have some problems attached to them, which we'll talk about when you're using it in this context. So thank you. All right, that's helpful. So um, what are the benefits of qualitative data? Okay, these are pretty self-evident. Respondents have a lot more freedom of expression, and they can give responses that are not anticipated by the researcher, which can be a little shocking at times. <laughs> um, when we get um, information we really did not anticipate, we'll be giving you some examples of that. The facilitator or interviewer can probe for clarification. This is particularly important. Um, how many times have you had multiple surveys come back with somebody circling both the two and the three because they want something in between? And when I tell people they're not allowed to do that, they get very resentful. Um, pick one, thank you, whichever is the closest. But I then want to probe for why it is so difficult for them and why they have to come between, somewhere between uh, moderate and extreme or whatever the case may be. Data are rich. And I love the fact that qualitative data are rich. They're really complex. They have a lot of depth and they have a lot of scope and they can give us um, the nuances of people's perceptions and their understandings and their experience, which can be extraordinarily valuable. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the analysis of qualitative data in this particular presentation. It's a whole presentation uh, in and of itself, but the I will say this much, the analysis of qualitative data is where we see a lot of folks fall down, and I think both Amanda and I are going to talk a little bit about this later. Um, another great benefit of qualitative data is that respondents feel greater ownership in the results. One of the things I love to do is I love to take evaluation data back to the people we collected the data from. And this is not something that we 
generally do as a rule. It's not in the prescribed list of best practices, and I think it should be. Because I know that the greatest resentment, again, especially when I'm working with schools, but in any context, the greatest resentment that I run across is people who say, I'm constantly asked for data, but I never get to see the results of those data. So really giving people the opportunity to have a chance to participate in the process of not only seeing the data, but interpreting the data can be really, really valuable for the purposes of what we are trying to accomplish, which is to give our program decision makers the best possible information that they can get. Now, as much as I hate to admit it as a qualitative methodologist, there are some huge drawbacks. Um, and I'm gonna talk about one first that's not even up here, and that's the cost of it. Qualitative data are complex. And Amanda and I were talking earlier and she mentioned, you know, you can end up with an awful lot of qualitative data that ends up going nowhere because you're not being clear necessarily about why and how you are collecting it. But also, do you run out of money? I mean, there's a cost benefit here to how much qualitative data you can collect and analyze because it is really time consuming to analyze qualitative data. And I have a certain bias against um, programs, um, uh, software programs that we can go into later if anybody's cur curious. And that's, I know, very old school on my part, but there's a reason. So let's just say that interviewers and facilitators really do have to be carefully trained in interview techniques. And so it's not to influence respondents unduly. And this is particularly important if you have multiple people out doing interviews. You really have to have, inter your inter-reader reliability is as true for your qualitative um, researchers as it is for your quantitative researchers. And the data are really messy. They're not necessarily easily quantified and they should not be quantified. And this is, and some of you heard me talk about this on April 30th, it's one of the mistakes that I think a lot of people who have a quantitative background do. is they wanna run a focus group and then say, well, out of the 12 people, eight of them said this and four of them said this, so this is what's probably true. And that's not the way it works in qualitative data. We're really, again, looking for nuance. One person in the context of a 12-person focus group might make a statement that becomes of extraordinary value to the program decision maker. And the fact that 11 other people didn't say it doesn't mean that it's not important. So that is some of the um, challenge, I think, of doing good analysis in qualitative data. It's also, by the way, one of the reasons I have a bias against a lot of the software programs um, that you, that uh, are used for qualitative data analysis. So I want to tell a few stories from the field and Amanda, jump in here. I haven't given you any time for anything. So do you want to add anything and do you want to tell the first story? Hey, sure. Um, so I, I, I will add um, from what you were just talking about as far as interviewer training. Um, I think that's so important from the perspective of that sort of consistency piece um, I also think, so as someone who I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mixed methodologist really by training, but I've done a lot of qualitative and quantitative work equally, and one of the things that I often get when I work on projects as a qualitative data collector is that people are, you know, I would say, um, to toot my own horn, they're impressed with the sort of richness of data that I might be able to collect on a qualitative interview versus what they may have collected on a qualitative interview, and I think part of that is those skills around probing, around being able to kind of pull out additional information from a conversation and kind of clarify, you know, am I hearing you correctly? Am I understanding what you're saying? Um, is there anything else you want to say? Or why are you thinking, you know, why do you think that happened? Those sorts of, of practices that I think it's very easy to, um, to sort of ask a question, hear an answer, and then move on. Um, and you can really miss um, the real richness of qualitative data without um, that sort of skill around probing and figuring out if, um, if there's a ways to get more, more information from your participants, which I think is a, a definite area of training and practice. I am so glad you brought that up because I just had that happen actually on my own team. Uh, recently I was listening to some recordings um, of some interviews that were done by one of my team members. She is trained in both qualitative and quantitative, but I realized what a poor job I had done of really helping her to understand what it was we were looking for because as I was listening to the question she was asking, I was hearing the responses and thinking, okay, oh, 
explored. Why didn't you ask this, that, or the other? Why didn't you follow up on, on this little nuance? Why didn't you ask about this? And, you know, some of that is going to be um, backseat driving, which I have to be careful about. But some of it is also recognizing the level of training and mentorship I need to be providing my own people when I am working with them on a, on a particular project. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's really crucial. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. It comes up a lot at work, and uh, I think it's really important. Good to see your face. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Just here. trying not to come in at an awkward time. <laughs> no, this is perfect. So I can tell a story about needs assessment, and then I'd love to have you tell one. And, um, you know, I would love – we've got – good. We're about halfway through our hour. I would love to have some stories from the field, too. And we have lots of stories here over the next couple of slides. But we did some, um, oh, way back when, it was, this was about 15 years ago, in a community, a local community in my county that is heavily Latino. Um, we were doing needs assessment um, around healthy families. And we, we did a series of focus groups. And we ended up doing 19 focus groups, 12 of which were done in Spanish. And we basically kept doing focus groups until we weren't getting new information, um, which is the ideal way to do it when you've got the resources to do it. Um, most of us don't have those kinds of resources. But in this particular case, um, our time was being given as an in-kind to this project because um, our agency leaders in our county really felt that it was important to be getting at this information. So one of the things that we discovered is that although there was a clinic in this town, it was not being utilized, and we couldn't figure out why, because we didn't have any black marks against it. I mean, there was no reason that we, it wasn't as though the standards were subpar or the delivery of services was subpar, what was going on? So we finally discovered two major inhibiting factors for why people weren't using it. This was primarily a farm worker community. And the hours of the clinic, and people, by the way, were traveling 20 miles to the nearest hospital to go into the emergency room instead of using the clinic. Well, what we found out is that the clinic hours were exactly coincided with the time that people were in the field. And if they lost a day's labor, they literally lost food off the table because they were they're making minimum wage. And sometimes they were also losing their jobs if they took a day off because there was always somebody who could replace them. And so that was one issue. A second issue is that when people went to pay, they were being publicly shamed by the person behind the counter. And we heard this in seven of our focus groups. So when you hear that over and over and over again, you know that there's an issue. Mm -hmm. So we took the data back to the clinic, and we gave that data to them, and they immediately opened up additional evening and weekend hours and they gave all of their staff customer service training, and they moved that particular billing person to the back, to, to records, and they brought people forward who basically had better customer skills. And that made all the difference. All of a sudden, people were flocking back to the clinic, and it took a little bit of time, but it did work. So that's a real example in going out for needs assessment data, we came back with data that actually ended up helping a clinic to change what it was doing in a really positive and direct way. So, Amanda? Yeah, pass the that's, really, that's really great. Um, and it connects also to the one of those um, methods from the last slide around using um, your evaluation or your methodological approaches to think about ways to attract more consumers to your program. Um, exactly. So that's sort of a you know, sub-benefit of, of that sort of needs assessment approach, which is great. Um, so I can talk a little bit about using qualitative data as part of assessing fidelity to evidence-based practice. Um, would, that, would that be useful? That's great. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, Fran mentioned earlier when she did my introduction, I'm currently the director for a program evaluation of a permanent supportive housing project for chronically homeless adults um, with histories of substance use and mental health issues. Um, and that project is using critical time intervention, which is a evidence-based practice for preventing homelessness when people make critical transitions from either institutional settings or homelessness situations into community living. Um, and it's sort of an intensive case management, time-limited case management model. Um, and there is a very formal approach to evaluating fidelity to that evidence-based practice that's primarily, though not entirely, but primarily quantitative in nature. 
Um, so you can really get a sense of um, how people are implementing it. It's a phased model, so it's broken down into three um, general phases with clear expectations around how much contact should be had and the nature of contact between case manager and client, as well as the kinds of um, services and priorities and activities the case manager um, conducts or, or in, initiates during each phase. Um, and so one of the things that we've done for this project and for a similar project using the same evidence-based practice is try to use uh, qualitative interviews with providers and program leadership to help get a sense of some of the sort of story behind implementation for that evidence-based practice. Um, so looking at, so, you know, I can see clearly where fidelity is high or where fidelity is low, and, and I can even look at patterns across um, client groups around fidelity, but that doesn't necessarily tell me what barriers there are to fidelity or what facilitators there are to fidelity. So we've used program um, interviews and focus groups um, to get a sense at really gleaming uh, what it is that makes implementing that evidence-based practice easy or difficult. Um, and then really thinking about that both from a formative and a summative perspective. So we can think about changes that need to be, ma be made so as they feed that data back to a program, um, they can consider whether they need to adjust, for example, how many um, people's caseloads by different phases or um, when people are contacted, whether they're contacted earlier, how frequently they're contacted, um, prior to transitioning out of the shelter, or, you know, things like that to maintain um, good rapport or to promote um, positive relationship building in the beginning of the program, which then helps um, later phases of the program. But it's also, from a summative perspective, um, gives that program an idea of whether that, that, that model, that evidence-based practice, was a, um, is appropriate for their program, is appropriate for their agency. And so we did an evaluation with them about I think it ended about five years ago, um, and they really liked the model. We used the evaluation to make tweaks to sort of how they use the evidence-based practice, practice, how to fit it within the nature of their program and their organization. And now in a second project we're doing with them, they've continued to use that CTI model with those adaptations in place. So one evaluation that was sort of formative in nature um, has informed the way the program has implemented the evidence-based practice in this new program, and we're evaluating it in very similar ways. Great. Okay. Excellent example. And um, Zach, I'm going to ask if we have any hands up at this point before I go on. Okay. I'm assuming not at this point. Okay. So don't hesitate to interrupt me, Fran or Zach, if we do have any hands up. Um, Piloting instruments, um, really, really important. Um, you know, I think it's really easy for those of us with a lot of experience to generate instruments, um, especially surveys, and forego the piloting of one, um, which is cutting a corner pretty drastically that we shouldn't cut. Um, one of the things that I like to do is take an instrument and then gather people who meet the same demographic profile of the folks who um, are going to be targeted with that survey um, and the, or the same content area of interest or whatever it may be, and sit them around a table and give them copies of the survey and have them sit there and take the survey. And then we, we tell them, you know, you can answer honestly or dishonestly, but it's your instrument. We're not going to be um, asking for the specific answers. We're going to be talking about the questions. And then what we do is we go survey item by survey item through the survey, and I ask them what they thought it meant. Um, I ask them, you know, uh, how they interpreted the language of it, whether it made sense. I ask them what they were taking from it. I tell them what we were hoping they would take from it. And we get into some really good discussion, and we almost always end up changing the instrument as a result of doing that pilot. Um, what's really important is if Dixie, you're doing a pilot, in, yes? I think we just lost your audio. No. Nope. It's back. Oh, okay. Oh, dear. I, now we hear you. Oh, dear. Okay. So where did you lose me? Sorry about that. No. Nope. I've heard you the whole right. time. Oh, okay. okay. Maybe it was just me. Sorry. Good. All right. No, that's okay. So I was going to say, if you're going to be um, doing a survey in multiple languages, really, really important to also pilot it in the other languages. And the um, feedback you get back may have an impact 
on the overall language of the survey or may be specific to that particular language. Um, and so, in other words, we really have to be careful um, that we don't just test the survey in one language or the other language um, because they may have implications for each other, if that makes sense. Um, so without beating that one into the ground, uh, if anybody has a specific question about that, they can, we can certainly take hands. Um, we had an interesting situation here in Kern County in California where we have something called the California Healthy Kids Survey. And it's a very um, pretty um, highly uh, reputable survey that's used statewide to collect information on a variety of issues, including drug and alcohol use. It's, it's um, given at the seventh, ninth, and 11th grade level. It's also available at the fifth grade level. Um, and it used to be active consent required in a lot of districts. Now, by state law, it is passive consent, which means we get a lot more uh, kids taking it, which is great. Um, we really used to have to work hard for our 60% to be able to have generalizable results. But we were very concerned about one school district where a lot of kids were talking about having seen someone with a gun at school. Um, there are questions about nutrition, school safety, all kinds of things. But um, whether or not you've seen somebody carrying a gun at school or with a gun at school, um, and we had a lot of kids who said yes. And so we had, and this was several years ago, but we had real nerves on the part of the administration after seeing that, the answers to that question. So we pulled students from a variety of different um, groups around the campus into a focus group, and we started asking them about different aspects of the survey data, sharing with them what we had learned. And um, we asked them if any of them had ever seen anybody with a gun on campus, and they said yes, and it was the school resource officer. That was one of those places where, ironically, here we were using a normed, and <laughs> normed sur survey that was highly reputable, and there's ambiguity in the way that that question's written or that survey item's written. And so that really um, led us to make some strong recommendations back to um, the generators of that survey regarding how those questions needed to be um, reframed. Um, seeing a student carrying a gun on campus is very different from seeing someone carrying a gun on campus. So that was another example of how qualitative data helped to explain some quantitative research results. And I'm just going to go into the next slide here for a moment. Um, we did something called a fishbowl focus group. And this is its own, again, uh, this could be its own presentation. But a fishbowl focus group was first introduced to me by Bonnie Bernard of West Ed, um, who um, used this method probably starting about 20 years ago. Um, again, um, to understand better the results of the California Healthy Kids Survey. So what Bonnie does, or did, I should say, and trained me to do, is to um, ask counselors and administrators on a campus to e select kids who are natural leaders from every major clique on campus and to invite them with parent consent to participate in a focus group um, that is going to be a follow-up to the California Healthy Kids Survey. And we would usually have five to seven questions that we would use in those focus groups. Um, I shouldn't say did, we do, we still use it. And we frame them around issues that came up as a result of the survey. So for example, if a lot of kids are saying that they don't feel safe at school, we would not ask, why don't kids feel safe at school? We would ask, how do you know you're safe at school? What makes you feel safe? Because the other information is going to come out as kids start discussing this topic. What we do is we bring the kids together. Most of them don't socialize with each other because they're from different cliques on campus. And we give them a half sheet of paper, and each question, is, uh, each question has its own half sheet, and we ask them to write their responses to the questions. And we talk to them about what it's going to look like when we go into the group. Because they have an audience of administrators, counselors, school resource officers, school nurses, um, other people at that level who have a vested interest in what they're going to say. We let kids know that they have amnesty, that nothing that they say is going to be held against them in any way, shape, form, or size, and that the adults will keep everything confidential that they hear. And I've been doing these focus groups now for at least 15 years, and I am stunned by the amount of information that we get from them and how much kids will open up and share. And as a result of doing a fishbowl focus group, which, by the way, when we bring the kids back into the room, the audience is sitting around them, and you make clear to both the audience and to the group 
that the rules are that the audience cannot speak at all. They are there to listen only. So they are flies on the wall. They are not allowed to catcall, applaud, roll their eyes, cheer, hiss, or anything else. They are there to sit and listen. Kids absolutely love this, and they respond really, really well to it. And um, we actually then um, go around and we have each kid read their responses. And the reason we have them write it in the first place is because they're more less likely to um, copycat each other. And then we facilitate discussion after everyone's answered the first question. And going back to exactly what you said earlier, Amanda, about looking at nuance, looking at perception, really trying to tease out some of the information that they're giving us. They tend to get, it, it tends to generate a lot of discussion and really interesting discussion. And as a result of a fishbowl focus group here in Kern County with middle school students in one district, we found out that the middle school students who were sharing a bus with high school students in the same small district were being sold drugs by the kids at the high school level on the bus. So um, those kids no longer share a bus. And we also, in another district, we were able to break up a drug ring as the result of, and this was another middle school, we were able to break up a drug ring that was operating on campus with an adult involved as a result of the information the kids gave us in that group. I've run many, many, many of these groups now, and one of the things I've done is ask students, why are you willing to share this information with me, with us? And, you know, I think kids are very honest, and they are feeling completely out of control. They are feeling scared. Um, they don't know what to do with the information they have. And so when somebody's actually willing to listen to them, they'll talk about it. The one thing I have to warn people is that don't ever do a fishbowl focus group if you don't plan to take action on what you hear, because you will destroy trust. And we've had really a ton of really positive outcomes as a result of doing these groups. We have started doing them now with parents and with other adults in other contexts, and it works exactly the same way. So. Another example of the use of qualitative methods that doesn't have to be very costly. That's another thing. We're not talking about lots and lots of interviews with lots and lots of transcripts. We capture most of what we hear in a focus, fishbowl focus group just on a flip chart, um, whereas in other contexts, I'll usually um, uh, record and then transcribe and listen to the, to the transcriptions. We don't have to do that here. So very valuable method for being able to um, really make good use of data and get some good insights about your data. So um, I'm going to turn the baton again over to you, Amanda. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I've never uh, I've never used fishbowl focus groups. Um, so it sounds really interesting. Um, so I, the second example I'll give um, is around uh, more quant. So the first example I gave was more sort of implementation and provider level data. Um, the second example I'll give will be more around client level information. So um, in this same evaluation that, that I'm doing right now, which is in the first year of, of operation, um, we are interviewing clients when they get enrolled into the program and then again 12 months later. And one of the open-ended qualitative um, lines of questioning that we have for that, that interview, which is primarily quantitative, it's primarily a survey with some qualitative components, is we ask them what their goals are at baseline. We ask them what their goals are for the following year. And at 12 months, we ask them uh, what goals they've accomplished in the last year and what their goals are going forward for the next year, if they were to look ahead. And, and that's interesting sort of just on its own, right? So what people's goals are coming into a supportive housing program, um, what they feel they've accomplished, and then a year after housing, what their goals are there. And sort of we can just look thematically at, at what what, uh, what's changed or what stayed the same, but we can also compare that and will compare that to um, more information around outcome and process data. So are the kinds of services provided, for example, in that year of their enrollment in a program, do they align with the kinds of goals clients are, are coming in with? Are referrals made aligning with needs or, or other goal areas, and are um, these sort of utility or, or benefits of having a case manager, because it's a case management model, um, do those benefits and services provided from a case manager align with those client goals? And, and that gives us insight not only into whether um, the program is sort of mapping onto client-driven goals, which is certainly a, a priority of the model that this program is using, trying to um, organize case management services and goals around client choice, um, 
but also can provide some potential insight into areas that the program is struggling to meet. So maybe not that they're intentionally um, not providing a certain kind of service or, or even that they're, they're unintentionally not following sort of client-driven goals, but maybe there are sort of systemic barriers to meeting certain kinds of goals. Um, so for example, um, when you're working with chronically homeless populations, an area uh, that is often a struggle is employment goals. Um, so there aren't a lot of specific employment services um, and models that are necessarily appropriate for people who are currently or formerly homeless. Um, so that might be a, a goal area that people have that the, the program tries to work with um, but struggles to meet. So if we look at outcomes along that, even if there are services and supports targeting employment um, from the case manager, those outcomes may not be reflected. And so it gives us a way to kind of more, um, more richly and more in-depth um, to get a more in-depth look at the kinds of services provided, um, how those things map onto client goals and aspirations, and where potential barriers to services um, and barriers to achieving um, intended outcomes might lie. Um, so again, this is a new evaluation, so we um, don't have I don't have data that I can uh, definitively say um, what this looks like or how this process has worked, but it is something that we've incorporated or I've incorporated into this evaluation. So I'm excited to see sort of how that flushes out. That's great. And you know, when you and I were talking earlier, I was mentioning that on an HIV project a number of years ago, we did follow-up interviews with people a year after they left treatment, and that sometimes that literally required riding the bus or going under bridges and you know asking people, and we did great locator forms, thank goodness. But it was a full-time job for one of one of our team to literally go out and find people. But one of the great benefits of that is that they had used the matrix treatment model. And we found we were using um, swabs um, to, to um, test to see whether or not people were under the influence. And while that's not the best method in the world, it did give us a little bit of insight. Lots of people were, and they were honest about whether or not they were keeping sober and clean. Um, but we had a lot of people who told us that what they remembered most about their treatment and what was most important to them, and we saw a real strong correlation between this and the people who stayed clean, was um, triggers, um, that they really learned a lot about their triggers and how to handle and manage their triggers, and the other one had to do with, um, oh my goodness, what was it? We had triggers and we had, ah, I'm not going to remember the other one now. But triggers was the number one um, that people found to be most, oh, scheduling was the other one. So the other one was really having a clear-cut idea of what you were going to be doing day by day so that you were not in a situation where you had a lot of time on your hands or where you knew that you were going to be going to a party but you hadn't set up the support in advance and so forth. So making sure that that scheduling was in place. Those two things ended up being the most efficacious for the people that we talked to. That had great implications for the program staff in terms of some aftercare that they wanted to, to do and how they could um, spend a little more time in those areas with people in hopes that that would help with their sobriety in the long run. So again, just really interesting ways that we can, we can use qualitative methods. My last example, and let me look at the time here, yeah, my last example had to do with knock and talk surveys. This is where you're going door to door and you're collecting survey information, but you're also generating a conversation. And we did this, uh, we're doing more and more participatory action research, and um, Amanda's going to be doing, during our conference um, in two weeks, she's going to be doing um, a uh, talk on participatory action research. I'm going to be doing one on fidelity, by the way, to evidence-based programs, so um, stay tuned. But um, what we found in doing the knock and talks, we had young people 16 to 24 who were doing research on the mental health needs of young people 16 to 24. These were in primarily Latino communities, heavily farm worker communities, and we knew that there was a lot of stigma attached to mental health care in those communities or mental health issues in those communities. But what was really interesting is the number of people who stopped our research teams to tell them stories, to tell them personal stories about a son or a daughter or a parent or you know, a loved one or a kid they went to school with or whatever it might be, um, and to talk about um, how scared they were and how they didn't know what to do and how um, people would talk if they went in and they got services in the community. And it really helped um, 
lead to some discussion, and we're brand new with this data too, so we don't know where it's going to lead in the long run. But um, our kids actually ended up, our kids, me a 24-year-old's a kid, um, they ended up doing a documentary film with the help of um, a media arts teacher that we had them working with um, about what they discovered. You can actually find that, by the way, on my, on my website, the link to it, and it's so worth seeing. It's a 15-minute documentary, and my website's transforminglocalcommunities.com, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to advertise because I think this documentary is a great example of how um, your client population or the, the target population that you're working with can actually be actively engaged in doing the work that needs to be done with their own population. And so there's value right there, but the other value had to do with what they did with this. They took this documentary and they have been doing community meetings and school-based meetings around their county with the data. This is in a neighboring county. And as a result, in at least a couple of school districts, they are choosing to show this documentary in every single classroom to generate discussion and to start talking about how do we normalize the willingness to accept mental health treatment. How do we make it okay? How do we acknowledge that everybody goes through depression at some point in their life? How do we acknowledge that mental health issues are all around us and that many of us are going to be, most of us will be impacted by them at some point during our lives, either on our, because we ourselves suffer them or because a family member or loved one does. So that ended up being um, a way, starting with a survey, but engaging a knock and talk survey and asking some of those qualitative interview questions along with the survey that gave us really important data that these kids were able to take back to their community and turn it into a plea for um, ways to address the mental health needs of young people in their community. So really exciting stuff. So we've had huge silence um, from people uh, in the chat room, and I'm hoping that's just because they are so intrigued by what we're saying, Amanda, that they just can't stop to read it. But um, I, I would love to hear either some questions or some of your own stories from the field, and especially those times that you ran into problems, because we're giving the good stuff. We're giving the stories of when it worked. But obviously, for every example of when it worked, we have examples of when it didn't. And so if anybody has a question or a concern or an idea they'd like to test out on us or a story they'd like to tell, we'd love to hear it. And you can raise your hand to do that, by the way. Any raised hands? I don't see any. Fine. Fran also brought up a question, um, you know, people might want to share if they feel encouraged or discouraged about using qualitative methods. Um, maybe the source yeah. of that encouragement or discouragement uh, might be helpful as well. Yeah, I think that's a great idea because, um, yeah, are we, are we helping or are we hurting our cause here? <laughs> <laughs> Maria, the, um, the hand raise is right above where you see the, um, the PowerPoint slide, and you'll see the, the, the person whose hand is raised. And if you click on the little arrow there, um, you can raise your hand, and um, and Zach can unmute you. Zach can do that uh, right now. Yep. Yep. And for anybody else, that's where that's where it yeah. is. Yeah, it's a cool little feature. I have yeah. to tell you, as we're waiting on hands, that uh, the one thing I don't like about webinars, as opposed to in person. That I can't read the body language of my audience, so I don't know when I'm losing them, when I'm boring them, or when I'm exciting them. So I have to go by guess and by golly. And um, so answer the survey questions that are sent to you afterwards, because that gives us feedback regarding what's working and not working about the presentation. OK. And uh, Zach has just asked uh, uh, what happens is people enter into the webinar um, with their name online and then their phone number, so we don't know who's who. So Maria, right. if you could give us the last four digits of your phone number, we will are happy to unmute you. Um, and does anybody else have any um, uh, questions or like to raise their hands? And um, when, what I meant, um, originally by the discouraging, encouraging um, question about qualitative data is 
when you are in your program, do you feel like they want you to do um, qualitative data or um, quantitative data? So what, what pressures are you getting from um, your clients um, and or other, um, you know, evaluators in your area? Um, do you feel like they're open to integrating um, diverse methods? Boy, is that a good question. Um, I know that in my experience, um, I, I want to start with the caveat that I feel as though as the program evaluator, it is my job to educate people regarding the benefits of both and the drawbacks of both so that they have a complete understanding because they're probably going to have a natural bias toward one. A lot of folks will ask for just a survey, can't we make it simple? But more of them will actually prefer qualitative to quantitative because they think that it's easier and they like the stories. They understand the stories and the stories are something that they can use to market their programs and services and also to make cases to their funders um, when those funders are not necessarily SAMHSA or um, a, a federal grant that is requiring certain kinds of data. So it's really a mixed bag. Um, I think the more that we can link qualitative methods to quantitative methods for people, the better off we're going to be in terms of giving them something that's really useful. Because I am a qualitative methodologist, but I use quantitative methods all the time. And I will often use them in preference to qualitative when resources are short, when time is short, or when I really think that that's going to be the best way to get the data that we need. And I think that we have to be aware of our own biases. We also have to be biases and really um, give them a complete list of options um, that make sense given the resources that they have to put toward evaluation. Amanda, you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I think um, my, I always, I'm, a, I'm very pragmatic as far as my research approach. I tend to be a, you know, use the method that gets the data that you need to answer the question or solve the problem or uh, whatever the sort of goal is. And um, I am routinely coming into conversations about method decisions, asking people why they want to do something. So, you know, we want to do a survey. So, well, why do you want to do a survey? What, what are you trying to get? What information do you need? Um, or we want to do a focus group. Okay, so why do you want to, why a focus group? What, you know, what, what are you trying to accomplish with that? Because I think people do, um, you know, quite easily either default to what they think is easy um, or what they think is valid. Um, and I actually, I've been in circumstances both where people have said, well, we don't want to go through the hassle of a survey because we have to develop it and test it and, and you know, sample and all of that. So we're just going to do a focus group. And, and so I think people can, can think qualitative is actually easier in, in that sense as well or, or even um, less resource heavy. Um, but it could, you know, if you're making a decision between a survey and a focus group to answer the same question, you're, you're unclear on your question most likely, right? So um, I often am coming into those conversations with, well, what's the, why are you doing this? Or why do you think this is the best choice? Um, because I, like you, I use both methods and, and um, don't consider myself necessarily tied to either one. Um, but, but often, because I have experience in both and, and as well as experience using them together, I'm often in that sort of counseling position of, you know, well, why one or the other? Or what's the question you're trying to get at? Or why do you think that method is the appropriate one? And is it really getting what, getting the information that you need to use for however you're trying to use it? Um, which I think is in a, uh, can be a very sort of eye-opening conversation for, um, for clients, absolutely. Well, and how you select your participants in a focus group also, because, you know, they'll say, well, I want to do a focus group, and maybe it's for a very valid reason, but they're selecting a convenience sample as opposed to um, using a more formal method for um, selecting people so that you're getting the diversity of opinion that you need. Um, I can give an example. We had a local museum that wanted information um, and asked us to do a focus group. And rather than selecting from the group of people who come to every event and who are board members, et cetera, et cetera, we went to their gift shop and we actually got the contact information from um, folks who had paid by check. <laughs> 
or by credit card at the, uh, at the gift shop. And we contacted um, a random selection of those people and offered them a $25 gift card if they'd like to come in and give their opinions in a focus group. Interestingly enough, in that focus group, and it was, I wish we had been able to film it because it was probably one of the best examples of a focus group that I've ever seen for teaching purposes. We had such a diversity of opinion. We had, in the same group, a rancher and a farm worker, along with multitudes of people from every walk of life. And interestingly enough, here in Kern County, we're the home of Cesar Chavez. And yet, um, the Cesar Chavez Museum is in Detroit, Michigan. And we had a rancher who said during the course of this interview, I hated Cesar Chavez. I hated everything he stood for. But by God, he is from Kern County, and our museum ought to be the place where we are celebrating Cesar Chavez. I don't understand why the museum is in Detroit. <laughs> and we got into the most amazing discussion. And who would have, had, who would have anticipated that response? But it actually led into another response about, or another discussion about the kinds of offerings that the museum was making and how we could make diversity front and center of that and really start to break down some of the barriers within our community um, regarding um, different races and different ethnic backgrounds and, and different ways of seeing the world and different ways of coming together around the concept of community. So what fun, but that was through a random selection of individuals that had very diverse backgrounds and experience. And I think that's another mistake that a lot of people will make is that we take the people who are easily available as opposed to the people who are gonna give us the best data. And the best data usually are going to come from a much wider selection of people. Did we ever, yeah, Maria is a, Maria is an absolute rock star. Did we ever get her? Because I know she's been trying to get No, her. I was just going to say, uh, Maria um, is on the phone. Please do uh, ask your question. We're really happy to hear from you. Yay. This is Isis. Can you all hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. I, I just had a question. Maybe if you could um, describe a little bit in deep, more detail your analysis method. Do you use? Um, in vivo or um, kind of kind of what 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 do you do with your flip chart or your transcripts once you have them? Ah uh, yes, Amanda, do you want to start because we didn't talk about this. You and I have may, may have very different opinions about the best way to do analysis. <laughs> um, yeah, so I um, let's think. So I tend to be um, someone who takes qualitative analysis from a very sort of iterative and recursive approach. Um, I basically, my sort of first step with analysis is always to read and reread whatever transcripts I'm working with. So oftentimes that's interview transcripts. So I usually do the first sort of round of analysis or round of coding more specifically on paper, um, starting with sort of a holistic approach to coding. So handwriting or highlighting um, to sort of identify or code large chunks of data, uh, large pieces of transcripts around um, either uh, codes that align with, if I have specific sort of guiding research questions, I might code based on those, or I may um, be more inductive about it and sort of code by what's just being represented in the data. Um, and then I do typically use, sort of follow that process with a more full, formal coding process. Um, and I've done that in, in sort of more old school, um, you know, paper and pencil or highlighting, um, cutting up a approach, depending on how much data I'm using or working with. Um, and I've also done that using uh, more formal software like Atlas TI. Um, and I, I like them both. I tend to like the software, especially when I'm using, when I'm analyzing a lot of data together. I think that the challenge, um, with those for me is that it's, I think it's easy to confuse data, qualitative software with qualitative analysis. Um, and those really, you know, the ability to code and organize your qualitative data isn't, is, is sort of a part of or even a precursor to the analytic process. And um, I think it can be easy for research, especially novice qualitative researchers to think that coding is your analysis and that sort of throwing it into a software program and coding it that way is, is enough. And so I do tend to be sort of flexibly let myself go um, back and forth between hand coding or hand reading 
I mean, handwriting to, to actual um, software use. And I typically use, um, there's a, a, a method of analysis by uh, Miles Huberman and Saldana. They have a, a couple books um, around their methodological approach for coding. Um, and I tend to use their model, which is um, a sort of a phased model of holistic coding and then a couple rounds of or a round of sort of basic coding and then a round of sort of coding your coding, essentially. Um, and then using lots of visual representation, matrices, um, network maps, you know, whatever sort of visual um, uh, presentations of data are useful. I'm a big fan, probably because my orientation or original training is, is in quantitative data, I'm a big fan of, of visualizing data, be it qualitative or quantitative, um, as well as them together. And so I'm often relying on um, visuals for both presenting data but also for analyzing data. So being able to cross um, themes, for example, uh, across multiple focus groups in, a, in an analytic matrix. Um, so I tend to do, do a variety of methods, but I often am someone who sort of goes back and does things again or takes a second look or, or reevaluates how I've coded an interview after I've coded 10 other interviews. Um, I think it's a Part of what makes it time consuming and difficult and messy is that um, your kind of ability to analyze your perspective, your, your uh, understanding and perceptions and interpretations of what you're looking at can really change as you analyze, um, which then makes you have to go back um, to other things that you've already done. Um, so I'd say that's my general, if you're looking for a resource, the, the Miles Huberman Saldana book I really like, I think it's very easy to read, very easy to understand, and a very sort of basic, straightforward, methodological approach um, to analyzing qualitative data, especially if you are someone who comes from more of a quantitative background. I think it's a nice transition into qualitative analysis for people who are new to it. That's, That's great. great. You know, mine is a little bit different in that, um, well, it's actually very similar. I don't use software at this point, um, and that's Probably, um, I just haven't gone back to review the software, frankly, in a number of years because it may be a lot better than it used to be. Um, but I have my multiple shades of marker, <laughs> and I go through, and same thing, I'll read, depending on how many transcripts I have, and I do record. Um, frankly, the only people that i found have a real issue with recording them is police officers, and um, even, they will, even they will relent, usually, upon occasion. Um, but uh, basically, I do record, we do the transcripts, and I read several transcripts, I think the same way that you talked about, Amanda, so that I'm starting to get the categories in my head of what I'm seeing. And um, if I'm looking for something specific, that's one thing. If I'm really looking to see what just emerged organically from the, from the research, that's something else. Sometimes I bring those two together. But I will start highlighting, I will start cutting and pasting, and I will... Um, come up with what I call the QQs, the quotable quotes, um, because there are things that I know I'm going to want to um, incorporate into whatever write-up I do. Um, if I have the luxury of the time, what I really like to do is I like to cut and paste a massive amount, because if I'm looking at three pages worth of quotes that are talking about a specific issue or concern, I just go through and read those three pages over and over, and then I start writing. And the analytic process is not even something I can describe. It's just something that kind of occurs organically within my own brain, which is not very helpful when you're trying to teach. But it is, um, it, it is a process that works for me, but I do have other people, when I have the opportunity, look over what I've been doing to make sure that I'm not completely off base, that I'm not missing some obvious things because of my own internal biases. Um, I think we always have to be aware that we have them. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would extend um, that sort of, you know, that process of, of peer checking and fits in with, um, you know, other approaches to validity um, around qualitative data analysis, and um, so that's certainly one way of doing it. Um, things like member checking, so bringing the data, like you were saying uh, earlier, back to the people that you collected that data from. Um, and getting their in, insight on your interpretations is another form of, of sort of ways to understand the strengths or, or potential accuracy of your interpretations. Um, and there are, you know, a variety of other ways, ways of doing that, whether it's um, thinking about um, looking, you know, one of the things I often do is, is really pay attention to discrepant cases. So 
Um, you gave the example earlier of, um, you know, if one person says, talks about one theme, but 10 other people don't, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person's perspective isn't important or isn't um, true or valid or even reflective of other people's experiences. And so one way to sort of get a sense of, of that, that tension, right? So is that sort of just an outlier that isn't representative or, or relevant across people, or is it something really meaningful that a program needs to pay attention to? Um, so one way to do that is to really sort of focus on those discrepancies, right? Those people that really stand out as potential outliers, whether um, they're answering questions in a way that's, a specific question in a way that's very different from other people, or if that entire interview goes very differently um, than other interviews, or if you have one particular focus group that looks really different than others. Um, so being able to kind of look at those, those distinctions. And there are a, a variety of other sort of, um, you know, validity to use a, a quantitative approach, but a trustworthiness um, of qualitative data as well. You know, as you say that, one of the things that also occurs to me that happens a lot in my experience is that because we're promising people um, anonymity, we're not promising confidentiality, but we're promising anonymity, and we do everything that we can to mask any information that could identify who a certain uh, quote is coming from or who certain information is coming from. Sometimes when we bring it back then to a group of people, um, and we say, you know, some people mentioned X, Y, or Z and talked about it in this context. We hadn't heard about that before. Would any of you like to comment on that? Sometimes what will happen is when people know that the information is being given anonymously and that their identity is being protected, they'll tell you truths that, they, that you are not going to get anyplace else. And if you are adroit about how you bring that back to the folks who are interested in your data, it can generate really honest discussions of things that become very important for you as an evaluator understanding their program, but, but that they were not open with you about in the first place simply because it was challenging or it was politicized or it was scary or for whatever reason. So sometimes just having those data that you can bring back will start an entire new round of discussion that can really be of value in terms of implications for, the, for program planning or implementation or sustainability. And thank you, and, Maria. That was a good question. <laughs> yeah. And we have a question from uh, Jackie Griffin asking about what's your approach for when developing key informant interviews? That's a great question. You know, it is. I could use a little more clarification there. Um, are we talking about in terms of developing the questions um, or making decisions about when and how to use key informant interviews? Amanda, do you have some insights on this one, or? I uh, no, I, 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 I think more info would be helpful, um, including sort of, who, you know, what key informants, um, you know, sort of who the who the targets are. I think my it my looks like a, Jack, yeah, Jackie's typing, uh, typing a little bit more, more okay. information. Um, um, is this? Uh, can you hear me? I'm not yeah. Jackie. I think. I think Jackie just finished, and this is Maria Messina. Um, I think we got, uh, I think they, I don't know, I, I'm not Jackie, but uh, I am Maria, and so I don't know who just spoke. I think that was Jackie. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. No, 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 not at all. I just wanted to clarify so that I hope I'm not speaking in Jackie's turn. Um, that, I, <laughs> that, I have your that I have your attention. Fitzy or Amanda, do you have any kind of, algorithm or way that you calculate or can try to project how long from start to finish focus groups, transition analysis, report writing takes. I know it varies according to the number of people, the quality of the, you know, the, 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 the language, etc., you know, how, how well you could hear it. But do you have like a one, one hour of recording is like four hours of, of analysis, something like that? I have it for transcription. One hour of one-on-one -on -one interview is about four hours of transcription. Um, okay. I don't have it for analysis because it really does vary depending on what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for the answers to a specific question as opposed to mm -hmm. looking for those organic kind of elements that are coming out of interviews, it's going to be very different. If I'm looking for the answers right. to specific questions, it's going to go a whole lot faster. 
if I am really looking at kind of the implications of what people are saying at a different level, I usually have more resources right. to devote to that, obviously. Right. Um, it's gonna, it's going to be much more time consuming. So it right. really does. Depend. I'm sorry, I have to be that that. Um, no. No, no, I appreciate that. I just, um, okay, may I ask another question? M um, you mentioned something about uh, sometimes just if you're doing a focus group or even field work for qualitative data collection, one person can say something that's just so insightful. For the skeptics to qualitative data collection, how do you characterize or you know, I don't want to say justify its valid validity. Yeah. Well, boy, I can so tell that you come from a quantitative background. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you, you just speak that language so beautifully. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. <laughs> but I have to tell you, you know, um, in my experience, I don't talk about how many people said this or said that. I simply talk about here are what the qualitative data told us. And right. if people say, okay. did you hear this a lot of the time, I'll be honest, you know. Um, but yeah. if I think that there's great value, and, you know, again, there's some built-in bias on my part here. But when I'm thinking about an evaluation, I'm trying to look at a program pretty holistically. So I know what right. the concerns are when I, you know, when I'm a year in. I know what the concerns are. I know what the issues are. I know what some of the staffing um, perspectives are versus maybe what some of the administrative perspectives are. I sometimes, hopefully by that time, know what some of the client perspectives are. I know where the communication right. breakdowns are, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of helps me determine how I'm going to present data and in what framework I'm going to present it. And I think, and boy, you know, Amanda may have a very different perspective on this. This is a great question, and I might have a different answer tomorrow because um, I haven't thought about it. But in oh, the moment, you. I would say that the mm -hmm. credibility of what I am giving in the way of data rests heavily on my credibility as, as a researcher in their eyes. And Very that has a lot to do with their experience with me over time. I appreciate uh, your go explaining that. Thank you so much. Amanda, do you uh, have any thoughts? I, yeah, I can add a little bit. I, I think I think I have sort of two points I would, I would share. Is one is that I think qualitative analysis Specifically, certainly quantitative analysis to some degree as well, um, you know, can't and shouldn't happen in a vacuum, right? So um, it's right. my yeah. analysis as a researcher um, shouldn't be um, shouldn't be where it stops. You know, I, I turn to peers for support or um, use things like member checking or even just get reactions from key stakeholders um, as they you know listen to and understand the data that I've presented. Um, so I think all of that kind of helps how we, the trustworthiness of our interpretations and the, the validity um, right. of where, what we're doing. I think the other thing that, that comes up with qualitative data, which can be a real um, uh, challenge as an analyst, is that it's often the case that sometimes you have people um, who are very articulate, who are very insightful right. now and who can really go on and on in very meaningful and interesting and rich sort of interesting ways. And then you can also have people who are um, have just as much to say, have just as much experience and knowledge and, and perspective, but who are less articulate, who are less chatty, who are less expressive, right. who seem less reflective in the moment. And I think it's Right. One of the challenges from a validity perspective and from that sort of managing your researcher impact in a qualitative study is being able to not just focus on the really insightful people, right, <laughs> and, uh, and the really right. articulate people. Um, and so part of that is the navigation, you know, balancing between those, those different types of, of interviews, but also being able to, to see value in in what a really insightful person can do in terms of how you analyze data. So for example, I did a recent um, project, not an evaluation, but I'm a PhD student. I did this as part of my PhD work um, where I interviewed a bunch of providers around their experiences uh, working with uh, young people experiencing homelessness. And I had one, one particular person who was incredibly articulate, very insightful, had lots to say, to say was very reflective both in the moment, but clearly very reflective in her practice and in, in her work. 
Um, and I, at first, really pushed myself to not focus too much about on what she was saying. But what I did was really use themes that came out of her interview to then relook mm -hmm. at other interviews. So it sort of created some sort of coding frames, almost, that I then applied to other interviews. And I think some of the mm -hmm. thematical ideas from that study would not have emerged quite in the way that they did had I not had her in the study and had I not looked so closely at what it is she was saying and compared right. it really to what other people were saying. Um, so it's, it's validity in qualitative data is, is more nuanced and more contextual and, and more, um, you know, it's, it's a moving target, right? It can change from, from moment right. to moment day to day. Um, and so I think you have to do your best to manage your own impact, manage your own biases, um, mm -hmm. but recognizing that it, it's a very different kind of validity than quantitative data. And so not to hold the same expectations, I think, is important. And you know, I, I appreciate how you said that, uh, oh, sorry, just, just, I no, appreciate, Amanda, that, uh, you know, when, you know, it was good that you said reflective in the moment. I find myself like that sometimes somebody asks me, question something I'm very knowledgeable about, but I, I pull a blank in that in that context. So key informants tend to emerge, I guess, is the part of the lesson. Yeah, yeah. They do. And you know, here's another one that we haven't talked about in terms of a method and that's participant observation. We don't use that heavily in um, program evaluation, generally speaking. Um, I certainly used it as part of my doctoral research as well. And um, that was literally maintaining residence in a recovery house um, for a period of time, um, several days a week, so that I could see the lived experience that the people were going through and see how they responded in the moment to treatment and to intervention and to um, the life experience that they were undergoing. We don't often have the luxury of that kind of qualitative methodology uh, use in program evaluation, but I can tell you that what I learned was worth 100,000 words just by observing behavior and watching interactions and seeing um, how communication occurred between staff and between clients and so forth. And, um, you know, if, again, if you have the luxury of doing something like that, you will learn so much. And it kind of moves beyond that point that Amanda was talking about where sometimes people are not very articulate about their own experience, particularly when they're in treatment, for heaven's sakes, because, you know, they're, they have so much they're dealing with at that point in time and so many issues are coming up for them and they're dealing with the physiological as well as the emotional, um, you know, issues. Um, so getting creative um, is just really, um, is really important. And we don't want to rely only on people who have been through the treatment experience and are on the other side of it. We want to make sure that we're engaged with people in the moment as well. And um, again, resources often determine how much we can do that. This is fun. Great. Well, yeah, you know, you. I'm. I'm glad you're on. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's it's 2:28, which means we just have uh, two more minutes. Um, so I want to I want to thank Amanda and Dixie. Um, we'll keep the room open and we'll stay on for a little while while people are completing the um, the evaluation. Um, so you can still ask a ask a few questions. Um, but thank you so much for um, for this insightful webinar and also for the really good conversation. And and um, I really do appreciate the folks who took the time to. To, uh, to call in and, and to write in um, because it, it really helps to just get a, get that dialogue going. Um, I wanted you to know that, um, as you probably already know, um, that technical assistance is available for you as a grantee um, on any pretty much any topic um, that you can think of. Um, and of course, there's no, no charge to any of you. TA is paid for by, by SAMHSA. Um, and I, I want to also remind folks that um, we are having a virtual conference June 12th and 13th and 14th. And um, it is actually required as part of your grant for project directors, uh, project managers, and evaluators. And we have a wonderful um, evaluators track planned for the conference. Um, Dixie's been helping us plan it 
planet, we have um, a number of people who are either current or former grantees presenting. So you'll get those really rich stories from the field, um, like you've heard today, um, and be able to connect with one another. So we really hope that you will attend that. We've, we've sent out um, registration forms for folks. And if for some reason you haven't gotten it, um, our contact information is on the, the last slide here, so please do contact us if you haven't gotten that, um, uh, that slide, um, I mean, gotten uh, the registration form. And um, yes, Maria, we'd love a story from the field as we're um, wrapping. Oh, you know what? It's 2.30, so we have to actually end, I'm just realizing. Oh, but why don't you type it in <laughs> next time? It, next time. It's about how quantitative data saved the day and qualitative data wasn't really getting, it was showing that the direction of uh, the program was going in the way it should, but that actually on a case-by-case -case basis, there's still a lot of clinical issues that weren't being addressed. So anyway, that's for another time. That's great. And you know, um, Maria, I just put my um, contact information in the chat. If you want to just even write us a little note um, about it, that would be great because we'd love to collect some of these stories so we can talk about them and, and, um, and sure. also potentially respond to you. So that would be great. Um, yeah. So, so um, uh, there are um, conti continuing education hours available for this, um, uh, for this session. Um, today's slide deck is in the download pod, and we really do thank you so much for um, for attending. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you at the um, virtual conference. The first two days we'll have, um, as I said, there is an evaluator's track, there's a program management organizational development track, and then there's a clinical track. Um, so you, you don't have to stay in the evaluator's track if you don't want to, and there may be people on the on the phone here, hopefully there are who um, are not program evaluators. So there's there's something for everyone. We've got some great keynotes, the, you know, from the very um, the highest levels of of people at um, Health and Human Services talking about um, substance abuse, HIV, and hepatitis, um, as well as obviously all the evaluation issues. So thank you so much for attending today. We'll see you. Um, at the virtual conference. We do have the third day of the conference, our poster sessions. Um, so you'll get, again, get a chance to, um, to listen to colleagues around the country. So thank you so much, and we'll see you at the virtual conference. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.